Good morning, church family, and welcome in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to our worship celebration. It is with great pleasure I welcome and introduce to you our dear friend George Bowerman, who is visiting from West Virginia. It's been six years since George returned home to the States, so we are just thrilled to have him here with us today. This is quite a remarkable story attached, or sorry, there is a quite a remarkable story attached to how George and Claire Lee Park came together through God's grace and goodness. I'd like to give you a short insight for those that don't know. An opportunity arose for George to come to Toronto to study music under notable professors. He was then looking for a church with a piano so he could practice. For, every, for over two years, we were able to offer George the use of the church to freely come and go to practice and study. However, shortly after George arriving, he acquired a refurbished baby grand piano from a monastery in the States, which his parents arranged to deliver right here into our sanctuary. So many blessings. This was such a wonderful experience for us all. George performed many concerts, and the church mothers and grandmothers ensured he was well fed and housed. <laughs> Strong friendships were made throughout this time with us, and they'll never be forgotten. There is so much more to the story. If you would like to hear how God was at work, we are taking George for lunch after the service this morning. So please let me know if you'd like to come along. There's still a few reserved seats available. So once again, on behalf of the entire congregation, George, welcome. We're delighted to have you back. And we look forward to you sharing your talent and love of music with us during the service today. May God continue to bless your life. For all other announcements, please refer to the updated news flash that was sent out on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Well, it's a warm welcome to you, but not quite as warm as last Sunday, and I'm glad for that. We're here to worship our gracious God. If you're able, would you stand with me as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Join me, friends, as we worship our great God in our prayers of adoration and confession. Let us pray. Lord, today we would join with the psalmist who invites us to come and sing to the Lord. Help us in our worship today to make a joyful noise to you because you are the rock, the foundation of our salvation. We come into your presence with thanksgiving. We want to make a joyful noise to you with songs of praise because you, Lord, are a great God a great king above all gods. In your hands are the depths of the earth, and the heights of the mountains belong to you as well. The sea is yours because you made it, and the dry land too, which you formed with your own hands. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. O oh, Lord, you are our God. And we are the people of your pasture, the sheep of your hand. Today, as we worship you, help us to listen to your voice and respond to you with joyful obedience. Amen. And yet, Lord, we acknowledge, even at the best of times, we fail to live up to our own standards let alone yours. So hear us now, O oh God, as together we would confess our sin to you. Let's pray together, friends. Heavenly Father, although we surrender our lives to you individually, we are called to live and serve in community as one body. Yet we do not always see each other equally or accurately. We tend to think that some are more gifted, more attractive, even more godly than others. Rather than claim Christ's righteousness for all who believe, we judge one another, even ourselves, on worldly merit. Forgive us, Lord. Redeem us from our wrong thinking. Empower us by your Spirit to live a life marked by humility kindness and gentleness toward your body, the church. We pray this humbly in Christ's name. Amen. Dear friends, hear the good news. Through the blood of Christ Jesus our Lord, we have redemption. We have forgiveness of our sins. The riches of God's grace have been poured out upon us. Praise be to the Lord who has chosen and made us his own, who forgives and cleanses us, who blesses us beyond our imagination. Thanks be to God. And as God has given us peace through Jesus Christ, so let's share the peace of Christ with one another. You can greet one another with words that feel most natural to you. Everything from the peace of the Lord be with you to God's peace or peace or bless you. So may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Extend that peace to each other now. Peace, elves. And online church family, peace to you. We continue in our worship as we sing together the modern praise chorus, Refiner's Fire. It's all about being devoted to God. Holiness is an attribute of God's character, God's being. Uh, and we would, we would aspire to that in our own lives. Let's remain seated as we, as we sing.
Good morning. Good morning. God's word this morning is taken from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Now, during those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, brothers and sisters, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, who we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, I want to add my own words of warm welcome and greeting to George Bowerman, who will share with us a special presentation, a piece of music now before the message. And George, uh, I can't count the number of times I've heard your name mentioned with fondness, with joy, with great affection, you, you have a big place in the heart of this congregation, and we're just so glad you've given of your time. I know you're just here for about five or six days visiting friends and uh, connections here in the city. Thank you for making time to be with us. So bless you. Um, Ken made the, or Reverend Ken, made the mistake of uh, opening the floor to me and saying I could say a few words. So, uh, uh, I mean, as Joyce and Reverend Kevin said, it, I mean, the, the feeling is so mutual um, in terms of this special place that, uh, you know, Claire Lee has in my heart. Um, you know, I, I really, I was so nourished by this place and by the generosity of the people here. Um, you really, I mean, mothers and grandmothers really did raise me in a way uh, in my early 20s. I mean, to the point where Joyce would find my socks underneath the piano <laughs> uh, on Sunday morning and, you know, shake her door. You know, you get it. You know, uh, or Alina, you know, knocking on the window, Denora knocking on the window, bringing me soup and bread and, you know, uh, you know seeing the lights on late at night and coming to say hello or to nourish me. Um, so I'm just, I, I'm, I, I couldn't say enough, really. I'm kind of speechless um, being back. It's, it's really like coming home for me. I'm very emotional about it, uh, actually, to see all of you. Um, and you know, this place just vibrates with so much love and, and brightness. And you, you all don't look any a day older. You all just, uh, really, truly, you saying I don't look any different. But I mean, I don't know what sort of elixir um, you, know, you guys have have found, um, but it's really, it's it's so special to be back. So this is uh, such a, a beautiful moment for me to see you all again. And I just love you all so much. I, I love this space. Um, so thank you for having me and, and welcoming me to, to play. So this is a piece by Brahms, Johannes Brahms, um, called Ballad. Um, and it's Ballad number four in B major.
prayers. Thank you. And the Lord bless you. Friends, the title of my message is Many Cultures, Many Ministries. As you know, over the last few weeks, we have been looking at the story of the first Christians from the book of Acts. That newborn church in the city of Jerusalem grew rapidly from a group of 120 people who were praying and waiting for the coming of God's Spirit to a group that now numbered in the thousands. This little story from the book of Acts that Patricia read for us a few moments ago shows how the first Christians were open to the Spirit's guidance in the way they live together as a church family. To remain faithful to Jesus, their risen and ascended Lord, the early church needed to be ready to move, to adapt, to do things in a new way to meet a challenge that had arisen in the community. Did you catch that? There was a fight in the church, a, a conflict that arose between two groups of people in the church, what the text calls the Hebrews and the Hellenists. Now let me take a moment to explain those words and how this conflict arose. The original church in Jerusalem consisted of followers of Jesus from two different groups of people. First were the Hebrews. These were Jewish people who lived in the, the region of the original promised land, within the boundaries of the old kingdom of Israel. They were intensely nationalistic, vigilant in observing God's law and the traditions of Judaism. They spoke Hebrew, or a similar language, the language Jesus spoke, called Aramaic. Jerusalem was their home turf. It was their cultural and geographical address. But there was another group among those first Christians, the Hellenists. These were also Jewish people, but they lived in the Mediterranean Greco-Roman world outside of old Israel. They spoke Greek and, and many other languages, in fact. Now, they too were loyal to the law of Moses, and maintain their faith in synagogues where they lived, but they were more cosmopolitan. They, they, they were more culturally aware in their outlook towards others. These Hellenistic Jews were part of the crowd on Pentecost morning who saw what happened when the Holy Spirit came down and filled those first believers. And some of them remained in, the, in Jerusalem and became permanent citizens there. But of course, they didn't lose their Greek cultural background, and that became the source of tension with the Hebrews. But remember now, both the Hebrews and the Hellenists responded to the gospel and were drawn into a close relationship with Jesus and with one another. But some of their old prejudices remained. And that seems to be the root of the problem in the story that Patricia read for us. We've already seen how the early church lived out an ethic of sharing, holding all things in common, as they shared their finances and their resources with one another in the church. They began distributing food to those who were in need of it especially for widows who had no one to care for them. They became the church's responsibility. There was no uh, social care network of the Roman government to provide. But apparently hard feelings arose among the Greek-speaking widows, the Hellenist believers, against the Hebrew-speaking believers, because the Hellenists were, they thought, being discriminated against in the daily food lines. The Hellenists thought the food wasn't being shared fairly. Now friends, in a strange way, it's comforting to know that even in the earliest church, things weren't perfect. 
They had their troubles, just like we do. Even after we come to faith in Jesus Christ, there will always be a temptation for us to split into factions. I went online this week and I found some silly examples of church conflict. Do you want to hear them? Listen to what I found. One church argued about the appropriate length of the pastor's beard. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you don't have to worry about that for me. One church argued about whether a clock should be removed from the sanctuary. Hmm, I wonder who wanted that. I know the pastor, uh, the pastor was, uh, he supported the idea. Nobody could time his sermons that way. One church argued whether it should be wine or grape juice at communion. I say both. One church argued over which picture of Jesus to hang in the hallway. I just want to know who took the picture. <laughs> One church argued about what type of green beans the church should serve at the church suppers. And another one fought over the kind of coffee they should serve in the coffee hour. Starbucks or Folgers? <laughs> one church argued about the words in the Lord's Prayer. Are we trespassers? Are we debtors? Or are we sinners? And I imagine we're all three. <laughs> well, I know those are silly examples. But some conflicts feel a little closer to home. Some churches argue about the budget priorities. How should we spend the Lord's money? What styles of music and worship should we offer? Uh, should we focus more on our long-term members or reaching out to newcomers in the neighborhood? And on and on the list can go. Well, how did the first church deal with this conflict? It says when the twelve apostles had this problem brought to their attention, they gathered the whole church family together and they proposed a solution. They said, it is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now, hold, let me stop there. What were they really saying there? When they contrast the ministry of the Word of God on the one hand with waiting on tables on the other, this does not mean that one task is inferior or superior to the other one. Now in Canada, I know, waiting on tables sounds like a waiter at a restaurant. But that's a misunderstanding of the text. For one thing, remember, it was the job of the head of the home in every Jewish household to distribute the food. Remember how our Lord Jesus led at the Last Supper, taking, blessing, breaking, and distributing the elements. And the word here used for table can either mean a dining table where you eat food, or the money changers table, the, the, the bankers table. Even though the passage mentions food, the distribution may well have been in the form of money in order to buy food, since back at the end of chapter four, the apostles received money to be used for the church. So both of these ministries are equally important. But there's an important principle here, friends, we don't wanna miss. Providing food and care for those in need is just as important as the ministry of teaching God's Word. But no one person is meant to do it all. The apostles were responsible for the church in its entirety, but they were not meant to do everything. That's why they're saying that we can't focus on table service when our call is the ministry of the word. They wanted to focus on their main tasks, prayer, and the ministry of the word. And so at that point, can I just say a personal word just between friends here? 
My calling as your pastor is to focus the lion's share of my energy on teaching and preaching God's word and praying for and with you, just like the early apostles. There will always be many other worthy activities that seek to pull me away from my primary calling. And you know sometimes, friends, well, if you know me at all, I'm usually my own worst enemy by trying to do too much. I notice Irene is shaking her head yes. <laughs> but listen, don't let me get away with that. Keep me accountable through the elders to keep my focus on being your pastor, sharing God's word, and praying for you, this beloved congregation. So friends, the apostles needed to concentrate on their main task, prayer and the ministry of the word. But they knew that the solution lay in the fact that God had called and blessed other people to serve in the congregation. People with gifts of caring for people like helping feed the widows. So they delegated and they proposed a solution. What does it say? You can see it in your bulletin in verse 3. Therefore, brothers and sisters, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now let's look at those words carefully. First it says, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing. That literally means people involved in the life of the church and trusted by everyone. It means people who were respected, highly regarded in the church family. Trustworthy people. Second, it says, it should be people who were wise, wisdom. That's the second qualification. Not wisdom in the sense of some special esoteric knowledge of a few, but people who were fair-minded and thoughtful, people with practical management skills, and a good a dose of common sense. And third, it says, people who were full of the Spirit. This means that their relationship with God should be exemplified in the way they were living their lives. Did they give evidence that Jesus is living inside of them by the way they thought and the way they spoke and the way they behaved and the way they made decisions? People whom everyone trusts, full of the Holy Spirit and good sense. Another parenthesis, these qualities, friends, should be the basis of how we select servant leaders in the church today, don't you think? I know it's tempting to bypass these criteria and choose people with natural abilities and training or just recruit anybody who will say yes and raise their hand. It's like I got volunteered, you know what, the presbytery, I got volunteered to be moderator of the presbytery. You know how I did it? Everybody else in the group went like that and stepped back, and I was the only one left standing. So, oh, Kevin, you can be the moderator of the presbytery. Well, I think the story in the book of Acts shows us a better way. The congregation thought the apostles' proposal was a great idea. So they went ahead and chose seven men to lead this ministry. Now, we aren't told precisely how those seven were selected. Was it a vote? Did they have a long church meeting and discussions until some names rose to the top? Did everybody else back away until those first seven? Well, we don't know. But let me read those names to you again in verse 6 that Patricia read so well. Or verse 5. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. Now, what do you notice about all those names? You know what? They're all Greek names, not Hebrew names. 
And this probably means that the men that they chose, that the congregation chose, came from the Hellenist part of the church. The part of the church that was feeling discriminated against. I find it fascinating that the early church showed real openness and grace to choose leaders from among the very people who were feeling like outsiders. And so these spirit-filled men, known for their character and wisdom, were brought to the apostles and with prayer and the laying on of hands were commissioned for service to care for the widows. Well, friends, what are we supposed to learn from this story for living our life here at Clarely Park Presbyterian Church? Let me suggest three things. First, we should expect and welcome and celebrate ethnic and cultural diversity in Christ church. The very first church, the Jerusalem church, was an urban, multi-ethnic congregation drawn from a variety of languages and cultures, might I say, just like us. It wasn't without conflict and difficulties, as we've seen, but their openness to be led by the Holy Spirit to do something new in their midst was a foreshadowing of the rest of the book of Acts and the rest of church history an ever-widening circle of believers encompassing all languages and all cultures into a worldwide family of faith under Jesus our Lord. Second, it means caring for the ordinary needs of regular people within our congregation, that this is a vital, important ministry. You know, in the rest of the book of Acts, there's lots of amazing, dramatic stories. Stories of outreach and persecution, testimony and martyrdom, sharing the gospel with the world in dramatic ways. But Luke, I think, in this story is reminding us that thoughtful administration and daily care for the needs, the internal needs of a congregation is also a vital ministry, not something to be devalued compared to the more public forms of witness and service. Which means, friends, that, that photocopying the bulletins for use in church on Sunday and planning the music for worship and phoning a fellow church member and faithfully administering church funds and visiting an elderly widow are all important, vital ways that we serve the Lord. And finally, finally, this story, I think, teaches us that every problem or challenge we face can become an opportunity for new possibilities if we ask God's Holy Spirit to help us. The apostles knew they could not do everything. But when they faced the problem that people were being neglected with honesty and openness, the Holy Spirit provided a solution which brought a strategy, a strategy of care and growth out of a squabble. May the Lord help us to learn and to live like the early church. Amen? Almighty and loving God, we bless you for the gift of your word. And we pray now for the grace to believe what we have heard and to live in ways that honor you above all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, the psalmist says, The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. So with joy we offer our gifts to God as a sign of our deep devotion and our covenant faithfulness.
Would you stand as we present the offerings, as we sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, because you love the world so much. Oh God, we pray for peace in our world. Move among us by your Spirit. Break down barriers of fear and suspicion and hatred. Heal our human family of its divisions. Unite us in bonds of peace and of justice. We remember especially before you today, O oh God, the people of Ukraine. We pray for our land of Canada. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this place of such abundance and a place of freedom. Enrich our common life. Strengthen the forces of truth and goodness. Teach us to share our prosperity that those whose lives are impoverished may pass from need and despair to dignity and joy. We pray for those who are suffering today in mind or body or spirit. Surround them with your love. Support them with your strength. Console them with your comfort. Give them hope and courage beyond themselves by the power of your Spirit. Lord, we pray for our families, for those that we love near and far. Protect them, Lord, in their homes. Support them through times of difficulty and anxiety that they, that all of our families may grow together in mutual love and understanding and care and rest content in one another. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick or in trouble or in need of your healing touch. We remember especially our own Dom and Marie Trimboli, both wrestling with COVID. And hear us now as we name others before you in silence. O oh Lord, heal these ones we've named. Work in them. By your grace, wonders beyond all they could dream or hope. 
And finally, Lord, we pray for the church and for our church. Keep us true to the gospel and responsive to the gifts and to the needs of all. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and make known your saving power in Jesus Christ by the witness of our faith, our worship, and our life together. And help each one of us to live this week with your love in our hearts, with your truth in our minds, with your strength in our wills. Almighty God, whose word we trust, whose spirit enables us to pray, accept our requests and further those which will bring about your purpose for the earth. Through Jesus Christ, who rules over all things. Amen. And now as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray the prayer together that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now we're going to have one more musical instrument join the fray. My dear Irene uh, was away at a conference, and we heard an an African drum called a djembe. So we're going to stand and sing We Are One in the Spirit, number 471, accompanied by djembe and the piano. Hymn number 471. Let's stand together.
and now receive the blessing. May the blessing of the triune God, holy, holy, holy Lord, be with you now and always. Amen. Thank you.